I have been doing some work with the um, Vanderbilt Art Gallery. And the way that I kind of got into this was through Wikidata. So if you're not familiar with Wikidata, Wikidata is basically like the database equivalent of Wikipedia. So anybody can edit this database. And so it's, it's like a crowdsourced database. And the, the notability requirements are really pretty low. You can pretty much put anything you want in Wikidata. So one of the things that we thought would be cool would be that the art gallery doesn't have a particularly great web presence. And so we thought, well, if we would create items in Wikidata for all of the artworks, then that might make them sort of like more discoverable by the public. So we, and, and also none of us at that point actually knew anything much about Wikidata. So it was also an opportunity to learn about what Wikidata was and, and how it worked. So we um, worked together as a group and um, I, had a lot of metadata that was basically spewed out of art store which is their like web um interface that they had they don't really have like a an exposed database or anything like that so i basically had a spreadsheet with a bunch of information about all of their works and figured out a way to get it um, uploaded into wikidata there's about um, roughly 7,000 works in the art gallery. And so by April 2021st, we had all of those um, in Wikidata. But of course, being an art thing, like why would you want to just see the metadata? Don't you want to actually see the artwork? And so the next phase of the project was to try to get as many of the uh, images that we have of the artworks into Wikimedia Commons. Of course, we could only do that for ones that were in the public domain. A lot of them are under copyright. But anyway, we worked on that and got um, and got 1,300 out of the 7,000 works um, that are now in Wikimedia Commons. So if you go to the uh, web page for one of the, or the for one of the Wikidata items, you can see a little thumbnail and click on it, and it'll take you to the artwork. So that was all very cool. Um, but the sort of findability of this stuff was not really great. The other thing is like the the way that they're characterized also wasn't very great. So like for some of the items, the description was artwork. Okay, so like what is that? It'd be better to have it be like statue or spoon or so on. And a lot of the works, like almost half of the works in the art gallery actually are categorized as prints. So this was very interesting because if you look at what, um, what those prints are, a lot of them are what I would call art prints, which is, you know, like an artistic print that doesn't really have text in it. But we also have a very large number of posters. And so, um, but they're all just called prints. Now, if I wanted to do this the easy way, I would just go through and look at all 7,000 of them and type poster or print or whatever. But of course, that would be too easy. So part of what we were trying to prototype here was figure out about like what text is on um, the image of an artwork and, and what can we find out or use from that to either characterize the artwork better or to expose more information about it. And so like an obvious dis uh, difference between a poster and an art print is the posters usually have words on them. So, um, so that was sort of like one of the, the big picture things is being able to separate out posters and art prints. The other thing is that um, the each a part of this database that we um, exported was a title of the print. And so for like for the title of a, an art print, this is called like an idol. Okay, well that doesn't doesn't explain like what's on there. It's no text at all. But the title for this poster is this device on hat or helmet means US Marines. So the title is actually text from the poster, and that's true for most of the posters. So one of the things that we can do if we can extract the text from the poster is just compare it to what the title of the thing is. And generally, if the title of the thing matches up with text that's on the thing, then probably it's a poster, although it's actually a little more complicated than that. But that was sort of the first thing that we did. So 
I came up with this like complicated um, flow chart of all the things that I was going to try to do by analyzing labels and um, and figuring out like what things are depicted on them and so on. But a key piece here was this step right here, which is to do optical character recognition on anything that's classified as a print. And then that would allow me to differentiate between art prints, which then I would do a, a different analysis. And then I would do a, um, another analysis if they ended up being prints. So that's sort of where this um, went into the workflow. So the first thing that I did was I'd heard about Keras OCR. And um, <clears throat> so I tried doing that a little bit. And honestly, it was pretty awful. It's like really, really easy to do. You, there, there's like five lines of code and you do it. And, and there's even this like little visualization, but it's a little hard to see here. But like it thought that 1999 was a word <laughs> and it was trying to make that into letters. It thought Mavericks was Eric's and Mav. So it, it didn't do very well. And the other thing is that if you look at the data, it just simply gives you a bunch of words in their coordinates. And so it would have required a lot more. First of all, there would have been like correcting of all the errors and then figuring out how you take a bunch of isolated words, especially like on posters where the words are in columns or stuck all over the place. Like basically it was a waste of time. So, um, so I kind of just gave up on that. Well, then I got acquainted with Aiden Layer. He he was a staff member, a temporary staff member at the library who was also like an art major. Or I, I don't remember what his major was, but he was in the art department. And for one of his classes, he wrote this propo project proposal. It wasn't actually anything that got done, but it was super cool. And he shared it with me. And uh, in particular, he had been playing around with Google Vision AI and Clarify, which are two. Um, sort of commercial services for getting uh, text out of images. And so I read through his report and decided that like, okay, I wanted to try using Google Vision AI because it seemed like it was really simple. So, and I'm gonna uh, try to jump out of the presentation and actually do this, but basically this is what the, the Google Vision AI um, like landing pages, they have a, um, like a graphical interface where you can try it by dragging and dropping images. And then it'll show you the image and over on the side, it'll give you the text. Um, so here's that example that I used and it, it actually did a pretty great job of getting the text and, and presenting it in a meaningful way. So let's see if I can get this to work. Okay. Sorry, the, the um, Zoom bar is always in the way. Okay, so here we are. So this is just at um, cloud.google.com slash vision. And then I just clicked on demo and it says drag or drop an image file from here or browse from your computer. So I got an image from our collection. Where is it? Downloads folder. Oops, here it is. <laughs> Sorry, I am so hapless here. Stop, I don't want that. Okay, album du siege. All right, so it's reading this in. Let's see how it does. Oh, I have to tell them I'm not a robot. Sorry. Okay, so it does it different things that I'm not going to talk about. One is it tries to identify objects. So it thinks there's an animal there. Um, it also tries to label it. Oh, it thinks it's a poster, but this isn't terribly useful. But let's jump over to the text. Okay, so it it's really quite good at picking up like these little tiny words over here. And then um, album du siège par du domier. So it, it's done actually quite a decent job here of picking the text out and it's putting them more or less in order. So this is actually way better than, um, than my experience um, before. Now, 
obviously I'm not going to want to just like drag and drop 7,000 images in here. I need to figure out a, a workflow to make this work. And so they have an, an API um, and I'll just talk about that in a minute. But uh, so, so you can send a command. So for those of you who are not familiar with an API, I think it stands for um, automated programming interface. It's basically a web server that a program can talk to. So you write a computer program, it sends a command to the API telling it to do something. The API does something and then it sends the information back. And the form of that information, that both sending it and receiving it is in JSON. So conveniently, if I click on this show JSON down at the bottom of the screen, here is telling me how it made the request to do landmark detection, face detection, and the one that we're interested in was uh, document text detection. So that's the that's the one we care about. And then here's what the results look like. So um, I'm not going to uh, belabor this because I'll show you results in a more uh, meaningful form in just a minute. So the next step then was to figure out how do we automate this and use the API. So, all right, this is just what I showed you. Um, but one of the things that is better from this than what I did before is that for each of the items, it provides you with the entire text that it found. And it's usually in some like fairly logical order. So like if the text is in columns, it'll go down the left column and then go down in the right column, or if it goes across on the page, so it usually puts it in a fairly meaningful um, order. And then there's also data about the position of every single token that it finds. Generally, that's like a word or a number or whatever. So if you wanted to do a more granular um, like analysis of where on the image the, the words are found, you do have that um, information available. But mostly, it just does a, a pretty decent job of grabbing the text and presenting it in a meaningful order. So I'm not, so I'm going to talk just in kind of a general way about this, the Python script, because I know there's some of you, the CS majors who like this would be trivial, and then some people who don't code at all. So what I'm going to do is just kind of describe in a general way what I did, and then this link here um, and the, the the QR code basically goes to the Jupyter note, or it goes to the folder on GitHub, which has the Jupyter notebook and also some sample files that um, we downloaded for the project. So if you want to actually look at the details of the code, you can look at it there. But basically, the this the process had four steps. The first thing that I had to do was to get the images in a the right size and format for what um, the Google Cloud Vision wanted. Then I had to get them up into a Google Cloud bucket. Um, so it you, you can't just like, you're running this in the cloud, right? You're not running it on your local computer. So having them on your hard drive isn't going to work. There's supposedly a way that if you have a URL, you can read it in from the URL. But in order to do that, you have to tell them all kinds of things about the image. And it's like, by the time I wrote the code to extract all the kinds of things they wanted to know about the image, it would have been easier to just upload them into a bucket and, and do it that way. So once you get them in the bucket, then it goes through each one of the images, tells the API, analyze this image, and then you get the results back, and then analyze the next one, and so on. And then I extract all the data that comes back from the API and put it in a table. So um, the way that we, so it, it turns out that a part of the process that we, um, uh, in uploading these images into Wikimedia Commons, we also have a IIIF server. And I don't know if you're familiar with this, but IIIF stands for International Image Interoperability Framework. It's basically a way that you can you can store a very high resolution image like a TIFF file, and then the server will give it to you however you want it. It'll give it give you any size. It'll give you it'll rotate it. It'll give it to you in black and white. It'll make it JPEG. It'll make it PNG, and so on. 
And so this is typically it's used to run like a viewer that allows you to pan and zoom and, and it's like tiled. So if you have a huge image, you don't load the whole thing, you load a smaller version. And then as you zoom in, it loads tiles. So it's like very sophisticated, but we were just basically, there's kind of a hack where if you give a URL to the server, you can just ask for the image in any size you want. And so what I did is I wrote some code that just said, hey, um, make this so that the largest dimension is a thousand pixels. So we kind of experimented and found like it did really well on images that were that big. If you give it like a 50 megabyte TIFF, it's just going to choke and say, I can't handle an image that big. But J, it was very good with JPEGs that are about a thousand pixels on a side. So this is really just kind of like an easy way, automated way to generate a whole bunch of images. Cause like the original images are all over the map. Some of them are giant. They've been taken over a period of like 15 years. Some of them are small, some are big. So this basically made them all be a uniform size. I downloaded them onto my hard drive. And then the next stage was pretty straightforward. You have to um, open, well, if you have a Google account, you can then open like a Google Cloud account. And depending on how much stuff you do, you may or may not get charged anything. The storage at the level I'm using was basically free. Um, and so you just, um, similar to what I did here, you just like go to your hard drive and say, upload all these images and they're in the Google Cloud bucket. So to use the API, then you, you have to create a project and you have to get an access key. And then thankfully they have a Python library that um, a, a client library called interestingly enough, Google Cloud Vision. Um, and if you load that, it basically does most of the hard work in talking to the API. It's not very complicated to like issue the commands to tell it to, you have to tell it like, what's the name of the bucket you put the image in? What's the name of the image? What kind of analysis you want it to do? And you have to put that into JSON and send it to the API. And so the um, those examples that I got from the web uh, from the drag and drop thing that I showed you were very useful for helping me figure out like how to structure those commands. And then they also helped me figure out how to interpret the results that I got back. So I did that. And then in the end, what I ended up with was a spreadsheet that basically had the ID number for the image. And then it also conveniently does a really good job of language detection. So um, a lot of them are in English, but some of them were in Spanish. There's some in Latin, some of them in uh, Arabic and so on. So it gives you the language detection. And then here's the whole, uh, the, the blob of all of the text first, and then it goes through each of the individual words. And here's the relative X, um, the, the relative corners of the bounding box that that particular word was found in. So if you want, it's like relative to the whole picture. And then there's also absolute coordinates, but that's not as useful. So that's basically what I got out of it. And let's see if I can find my cursor, how did it work? So here's some examples of results. I was like really pretty impressed, particularly in that earlier, the earlier um, experiment, it did a really bad job on weird fonts. And you can see these are like three really weird fonts. And if you look at the top one, I mean, it made a few mistakes, but not very many. And uh, it also got like the capitalization correctly. It got the diacritics, apostrophes. It pretty much picked all that stuff up. Now, I don't read Farsi, but um, this is a Persian manuscript. Um, and it identified it as Farsi, so that was cool. And I don't know how accurate this is, but it's like script, and it at least made an attempt to turn that into characters. So I would need somebody who knows Farsi to tell me like what the accuracy was. But down here, if you look at this Latin, um, it, again, given that this is in like a really uh, a weird script, it made relatively few mistakes. It didn't get any of the illuminations. It basically missed those, but for even for most of the characters, it did a pretty good job. So basically I was highly impressed with how well it did in both recognizing weird fonts and also 
taking text that was scattered around on weird places on the page and putting it together in some kind of a string that was like fairly recognizable. So basically where we got to, um, oh, forgot to talk about the cost. You can do a thousand images per month for free. And we had about like, I don't know, 1500. So I think it cost me about $4 to do this analysis. So, I mean, if you had hundreds of thousands of images to do, it could be expensive, but if you have like an on the order of thousands of them, it's, uh, you know, I just paid for it out of my, it, it wasn't worth trying to get reimbursed for it. It was small enough of a cost. So it was quite economical uh, to do this. So um, so we're, we have all these data now. I have a student who's working with me on this. And so one of the things that we would like to expose in Wikidata is there's a field called inscription. So like I said, a lot for a lot of the posters, the um, title given to the poster is part of the text, but there's usually additional text. And so we would expose that under maybe the inscription term. term. The other thing is that um, there's a label field, and then there's also a title field in Wikidata, but Wikidata demands that the title field has to be language tag. And so right now, when we created those 7,000 items, the only titles that we have are the English ones, because we just hadn't dealt with the other languages. So I'm going to use the language tagging, as well as the analysis we did on the labels, to try to kind of parse out the titles and assign them the proper language tag. Um, and so this is gonna help with, this is kind of a cross check. If the poster language detection says, you know, Hebrew and the actual, um, well, they're all in Latin script, so Hebrew is not a good example. French, okay. If the label analysis says it's in French and the poster analysis says it's in French, then probably it's in French. So the um, so that's another way we're gonna use this. The other thing is I said that is a little bit complicated about the poster thing. So I oversimplified by saying that if it has text on it, it's a poster. But actually there's quite a few instances of text that are not posters. Sometimes they are captions. So here's two different forms of this. So the first one is like a descriptive caption. So this Baron Vincenzo Mistrali di Parma, that's the first part of the text on there, but then there's also additional text on there. It's basically a caption describing what this is a picture of. In this Damier and Cham print, it's like a cartoon, and this is basically the text of the cartoon. So I'm not quite sure how we would classify these, but I don't think they would be called posters. And so one of the questions is, is there any way we can use this analysis um, to decide between if we have like posters, captions, and cartoon uh, captions or something like that? Could we use the positioning of the characters? Like usually the captions are near the bottom. So if we could come up with some rules, um, we could let it attempt to differentiate between these categories based on the position of the text here. Again, like if you only have a, a 7,000 things in here, you can just do them all by hand probably faster. But part of what we're trying to do is like prototype this. If we went into special collections, we wouldn't be talking about 7,000 things. There would be hundreds of thousands of things or something. And so if we can figure out how to do this kind of stuff here, we could maybe scale it up uh, other places in the in the library.